name is Jonathan Sarna. Uh, I'm the director of the Schusterman Center for Israel Studies here at Brandeis. And it's really a pleasure uh, to welcome you to this, our final scholar seminar for uh, academic year 2020-2021. Uh, uh, and we're in for a treat. Uh, uh, today, uh, 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 Dr. Lilach Lachman will be speaking to us on voice, audience, uh -huh. and gender in the Hebrew and Arab lullaby. And we'll even hear some lullabies. What a wonderful way to finish out our uh, season of seminars. Lilach Lachman teaches in the Department of Hebrew and Comparative Literature at Haifa University. Uh, since the 1990s, she's contributed to the prestigious book review uh, section of the Israeli newspaper Haaretz. She's edited an anthology of lullabies She's written quite extensively on the Israeli uh, uh, poet and writer Avot Yushurun. She translated Emily Dickinson's poems uh, and has recently edited, edited a selection of Nurit Zarchi's poems, Va'at, uh, as well as co-editing um, a group of her essays. And um, uh, she now has a forthcoming book, Ketav Adam, uh, on Avot uh, Yeshurun. Uh, two housekeeping notes before I turn the program over. Um, please put any questions in the chat feature at the very bottom of your screen. Um, uh, we... Um, We'll be monitoring the chat and uh, the associate director of the Schusterman uh, Center, my colleague, uh, Dr. Shana Weiss, uh, will be heading the question period uh, in about uh, uh, 45 minutes. Uh, also, um, at the bottom of your screen, you'll see that there on the right, it says live transcript. If you prefer not to have a transcription on the screen, uh, just press the appropriate button and it will disappear. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming Lilach Lachman to the Schusterman Center. Thank you, Jonathan Sarna. I'm very excited to be hosted by you at the Brandeis Seminar of Israel Studies. Even though I had hoped to meet you and your wonderful staff who, had, who have made this talk possible and the seminar's participants face to face and in person, I'm grateful that we, that we can interact within a common virtual space. I'm somewhat apprehensive Will the screen through which we communicate right now bridge the space between my home study here in Herzliya in the Middle East where night is approaching and the lulling chirps of alien Minas will soon take over and your time zone on the east coast of Boston where woodpeckers are maybe awakening to midday. I'm also very aware of the fact that the Zoom media by which we communicate drastically differs from the immediacy of the bodily vocal message of the lullaby that I will address today. I hope, however, that the cradle songs, multiple traditions and mother tongues will help to overcome the distance between us. Before sharing with you two or three junctures, in what may be called an nocturnal journey within Israeli culture. I will briefly introduce my project, its evolution, its motives, and some of its building blocks. 
It all started with my mother's voice. I recall her whispered but dramatic reciting of Goethe's ballad, Earl Koenig, which she used to recite to us before we fell asleep. Verreitet zu spät durch Nacht und Wind. Es ist der Vater mit seinem Kind. Er hat der Knaben wohl in den Arm. Er fest im Sicher. Er hält im Warm. How her intimate spellbinding German would shift to an expressive harsh Hebrew when she recited Miriam Yelan Steckley's Tale of the Solitary Girl, a night poem written in the voice of a little girl who awakens in the middle of the night, disoriented and traumatized, not quite sure that the emptied house is in fact hers. Rek habayt, rek kol kach, kol kach lo shelanu habayt. My mother was severed not only from her mother's language, German, and the songs of her childhood, but also from the speech, gestures, and body codes that are indispensable to the mother tongue. This was the price many of her generation paid as their immigrant tongues were violently displaced by Sabra Hebrew. Traditional Jewish tunes or sad Slavic melodies were set to words that announced, quote, pride in Hebraism and, quote, a commandment to conquer. The songs were to convey to the infant the people afflictions and nourish hope and faith in national revival. Mothers were transmitting such messages while thinking during one war and the next amid salvos of bombs on the brink of abyss. For a fighting mother exhausted and crushed, as one poet described her, there was no leisure to linger over the language of the land. She would sing from the mouth of the Zionist poet, Emmanuel Harusi, sleep son, sleep, and immediately burn the barn in Tel Yosef from Beit Alpha, the smoke rises. And in these lines, which were written in 1929, the poet addresses his son, Abner, alluding to the 1929 pogrom in Hebron. I started collecting lullabies decades later when my father was on his deathbed. The anthology I compiled that you see in front of you, the cover, uh, came out a year after my mother's death. And between these events, my close friend lost her son, another friend lost her daughter. I myself became a grandmother. The horror of children being killed here and there has not ceased. As I find myself singing to my grandchildren, sleep daughter or come mom, I encounter from an altogether fresh perspective, the eyes of the little one fixing her gaze in the dark, making sure the closed face doesn't disappear. Yavog Dizahab, my book title, Come Golden Land, alludes to Israeli poet Uitzvi Greenberg, acclaimed lines, the mother sang and sang about it, a cold lamb will come in one of the a gold lamb will come in one of the hours in, from 1929. Anticipating the horrors of World War II, Greenberg was playing with a well-known motive in the Yiddish lullaby, expressed the Jewish exile, the mother's soothing night song, its shattered dream, and its ominous future. My anthology was born out of my sense of a rapidly changing world in which legacies of memory are erased and the lulling tradition is endangered by digital technologies. My anxieties as a mother, as an avid reader of poetry and as a contributor to a poetic historiography of Jewish modernism, led me to pursue the lullaby's contemporary significance at a moment when lulling might seem bankrupt. And I'm thinking, of the urgent sardonic note in Yehuda Amichai's 1983 lullaby. Give the child lullaby, sing that he'd sleep. The house collapses, the world's on fire, but sleep. While he desperately invokes the lulling note, but sleep. The poems escalate a discord, really undercuts the intimate address that is vital to the lyric. 
Stunned by the poem's refrain, we readers are called upon to awaken from our indifference when we discover too late, perhaps, that we have fallen asleep while on guard. Meanwhile, the child himself, the song's inner addressee is gone. Take the child from the lullaby and the song will drift through and will make him sleep for good. Bearing in mind this brutal severance between the child and the lullaby, a central question I will pose is whom does the lullaby address? While preparing the anthology and in my searches ever since, since I discovered that this poem by Amichai, as well as other controversial songs and poems that have been written for new audiences are part of an entire Jewish Israeli cultural history, one which is discernible in the metamorphosis of the genre throughout the 20th century. Along with this, we can also observe the repression of the whole host of diasporic women's songs and poems that the Israeli canon has overlooked. Many Hebrew lullabies are inextricably linked to the experience of childhood at the onset of the Zionist enterprise. They were conscript, uh, conscripted to spread the idealism and the Hebrew language, both of which were keys to the Zionist dream and were disseminated via children's school books, educational programs, and nurseries. However, the evolution of the lullaby and its recurrent scenes also show us that Hebrew poetry is far larger continuation of the diasporic experience prior to Zionism. This is central to the point I wish to make today and is why I found myself changing my title several times from Israeli lullaby to Hebrew in Arabic and vice versa and from west to east and back from east to west. Against this backdrop, I particularly wanted to highlight both Yiddish and Arab and Middle Eastern songs that were disregarded by the formal Hebrew canon. My anthology therefore brings together a collection of voices that spans the range of Hebrew poetry and encompasses divergent traditions from East and West, from Samaria to Akkad, Morocco, Iraq, Palestine, ancient Hebrew prayer to modern Hebrew. Translated from a variety of languages, including Ladino, Bedouin, Amharic. In my current research, I am now exploring the modes by which the modern Hebrew lullaby evolved as a hybrid genre that turned away from both Zionist folk songs, which initiated the child international heroism, and the no less binding purisms of Israeli modernism, taking up instead and engaging poetics of impurity of the multilingual diaspora born on the boundaries of repressed Jewish mother tongues. Within this cultural history, which I can only begin to, to sketch roughly here, voice is a foremost figure. Since its inception in a Sumerian spell during the 12th century, through its involvement in Middle Age hymns and allegories and Iraqi Jewish songs from the 19th century to contemporary Palestinian nursery songs, the lullaby genre has been associated with the female voice and with women's modes of transmission, her hardships, her body, and even her breath. However, voice is not a given. It is rather formed as a fluid construct often split between different perspectives and conflicting gendered aspects. Marina Varner points to the duality that informs the lullaby, officially settling the infant to sleep to banish the fear of the dark, but in fact, also aiming to calm the caregiver and make the daily struggle bearable. In Hebrew, Yiddish, Iraq, and Moroccan lullabies, oral performance that is attributed to women has been often mediated by uh, uh, in writing by men. And when I worked on the anthology, I was surprised to discover how many cradle songs 
had in fact been written by men. In some, the man adopts the voice of a female who insulates the child against the world's violence. The cuddling man apparently revives ancient rites in which, in which men wore women's clothes as part of healing rituals. Such duality of male-female roles can be detected in the first Arab lullaby, which is dated to the eighth century. And I would like to share it with you. Uh, the English version, which I will be sharing here that you see in front of you was translated for this talk by Daniel Behar. Uh, he actually translated it for me last night. I had other versions before. Uh, I would like to take a moment to listen to the poem read by Kautar Asla. Uh, and please, Chaim, can you play it? مالي أبي حمزة لا يأتينا يظل في البيت الذي يلينا غضبان ألا نلد البنينا تلاه ما ذلك في أيدينا وإنما نأخذ ما أعطينا ونحن كالأرض لزارعينا تنبت ما قد زرعوه فينا This radical song recorded in Al Jahi's book of eloquence and demonstration is attributed to the Bedouin poet Abu Hamza, who according to Al Jahi's abandoned his wife because she gave birth only to girls. One day as Abu Hamza passed by his wife's tent, he heard her singing to her daughters. Why does Abu Hamza not come to see us, angry that we don't bring sons? By God, that's not in our hands. At that very moment when Abu Hamza witnessed his wife singing to their daughters, who may have been lulling their own infant girls, reporting the father's desertion, he returned home. The scene maps female territory in distinction to men's. Their singing, their bearing and growing the seeds that have been sown in them defines the function of maternal care and their vulnerability to the father's assault. And what make this stark uh, rhyme prose so potent, I think, is, is the mother's plural voice addressing at the same time her daughters, her husband who stays next door and God. I think it's really amazing how such a condensed lullaby has this triple address that creates an action in the world. The performative force of the lullaby leads Abu Hamza to return home. In this respect, the mother singing dramatizes home territory as analyzed by Deleuze and Goatari, not as a fixed abode, but as a regrouping of forces. The conflicting perspectives, the singers, the child, that of the adult audience, differ in their spatial experience, while the intimacy offers us dreamlike self-forgetfulness. The nocturnal space is charged with struggles, omens, and power dynamics. Likewise, the crib, Arisa, in Hebrew, epitomizes source and origin, but at the same time is perceived as a space of hybridity. In Hebrew, we know the etymological kinship between Eres, bed, cradle, and a harmony of Eres with Aleph. Eres meaning a melange, a hybrid. In what follows, I contend that from the earliest lullabies through the Holocaust and beyond, cradle songs serve as a map of both kinships and differences. More specifically, in varying and different traditions, such as Andalusian, Yiddish, Iraqi, and Hebrew, the lullaby linked with the mother's body is culturally constructed and its rhythms are attributed to community or nationality. Lorca, describing Spanish lullabies, detected a kinship between the Andalusian poem drowned in its blood with the national genus and identified it in the ancient spirit of his people. A musical and textual contact between the crib, the community and nationality exists also in Iraq where women's songs are performed and written in a specific elegiac rhythm. In other words, the mother tongue myth that is embedded in the lullaby locates the singer within a set of relationships 
that imply a narrative of identity, gender, and nationality. The poet Noah Pines alludes to such a correlation in his introduction to Hazamil, the nightingale, um, uh, the first collection of Hebrew children's songs, some dated to 1903, some dated to 1910, um, which offered a new generation of children a model of speech, behavior, and identity. Even though Pinus declares the need for pure poetry that accords with the child's spirit and understanding his own collection, which opens with the lullaby and closes with Naftali Health's Imbers, well-known Hatikva, which is up to date our national hymnon. Uh, 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 so his own collection pul pulsates with national spirit. Lifshitz's formative poem, written in 1893 and considered the first Hebrew lullaby, calls upon the child to fulfill the Zionist vision by becoming a vine grower, shepherd, farmer. Note how the national idea of working the land is bound with an identity narrative, and the origin myth is imposed on the child by means of monologic Hebrew speech. Moreover, the homology, first I will tell you, my son, uh, then Israel, your name calls you, your breed and origin, employs the lullaby frame in the mouth of a male poet transmitting the Zionist ethos. So male poets wrote lullabies, they used um, the um, situation that actually caused uh, female transmission, but that's how they conveyed their ideological messages to the public and to the teachers and to the educators, and maybe also to the virtual children. The dynamics connecting the singer to an actual rather than a virtual audience were rather explosive for Dvorah Ben Yehuda. Her address to the elder Hebrew child translated from Russia and composed in the 1880s in Ottoman Jerusalem is recorded by her son Itamar ben Abi, whose father Eliezer ben Yehuda was the founder of modern Hebrew. Ben Avi recalls that one day his father who forced his wife to speak only Hebrew at home, returned home unexpectedly and heard his wife singing in Russia. Alas, in sheer anger, he founded on the table, the very table on which he had begun to work on the great Hebrew dictionary and smashed it to pieces. Itamar, who was considered mute until that moment, and that moment he was eight, three or four, recounts from my great shock at seeing my father and enraged and my mother sobbing, the dumbness was removed from my lips and speech came into my lips. In dialogue with Nami Seidman's reading of this memory of Ben Avi as the primal scene of the revival of Hebrew as a spoken language, I would like to draw attention to the performative force of the lullaby in this anecdote, which narrates the child's trans transition full of obstacles and tension from the mother's original tongue, whether Russian, here it's Russian, it could be Yiddish or Arabic or other, to Hebrew as an acquired father tongue. As you may know, the first word that Ben Avi recalls to have offered, and actually it came out at this occasion is father, father, Abba. Interestingly, the poem's title is absent and the original we have is transmitted to us by means of Hebrew as a translating tongue. The translated poem itself, and this is, uh, forgive me, this is the only poem that I didn't provide you translation for. Maybe it's, it's not a coincidence. The translated poem itself is read as the Hebrew between biblical language, my elder, Bechori, my psalm, him, Mizmori, son of my sorrow, Ben Oni, and, and sporadic patterns of stress, which became standard in Palestine. and. The, all this is kind of um, comes together with rhythmic traces of the mother tongue 
that are materialized in the triad meter in words that recall the Ashkenazi accent, an ima, anima, arbaim, etc., some of which are enforced by the rhyme and sound patterns that echo the mother's body language. It has more stanzas. I only brought here two. Um, although time restrictions preclude detailing such analysis here, we may note that the emergent multilingual vocal performance that is encoded in Vora Ben Yehuda's Lalibai, an event that occurs in rapport with the real child, stillfully, while the father is absent, give birth to the Hebrew subject, as much as to the maternal sound voice within an interweaving of languages and communities. So far, I've only sketched the beginning of what I promised to be an external journey. A lot has been left out in the twisted transitions that the lullaby underwent from the first part of the 20th century, when for the adult pioneer, Shir Eres played cradle song, literally a song pertaining to one's bed, evoking childhood rhythms was also requited to demarcate a new home space, quote, marking out a wall of sound in the controversial territory called homeland to the ad adaptations of the cradle song from the 1980s to the present, which hardly represent lulling, nor do they intend to address the child. In such reframing as we witness in Rabikovich, Zelda, Amichai, Hanoch Levin, Avot Shirun, and Noit Zachi, the interplay with Cradle Song has largely been deployed for a completely different reasons, not to talk to a child, but maybe to re-examine uh, identity borders, to awaken the readers, to resistance, to address the other, to there, there are many, many roles for the reframing of the lullaby. But meanwhile, we, we lost the child. Uh, if I may, I would like to end my talk uh, by sharing with you two Israeli reframing of the lullaby. Uh, the first is Natan Altelman from 1948 which not only divides the lullaby from its, audience, from its audience, but in fact, almost literally eliminates the poem's implicated addressee. And the second is Habiba, uh, Habib Abdaya, uh, Habib Abdaya uh, Requiem uh, uh, for her mother. Uh, and we will maybe talk about it a little bit uh, uh, later, Kaddish Vehilula Laem, Kaddish and uh, celebration for the mother or laying down my mother. He, it had different uh, uh, titles. Um, so I, I would like to, if I may, I would like to share with you and to maybe we will just listen to the sounds of um, uh, ex. One of them will be uh, the song and the other, which is a big work. We will just uh, listen to uh, part of it. So first we will begin uh, with um, Natan Altelman. And I, I should just say that uh, the, the ballad, Laila Laila, Night Night, was written by Altelman for the satiric theater Lila Lo performed in 1948. The music which was written by Mordechai Zaira has char characteristic East European flavor. Uh, it has become one of the most popular Israeli songs and uh, it has been performed in approximately 40 different versions. And uh, I chose uh, the one performed by the American singer, Harry Belafonte. Um, maybe we will hear it. Laila, Laila, a ruach governed. Laila, Laila, a mahatsa Laila, Laila, a 
Yes, this is very enigmatic and uh, it, it was sung to, to many of us, of, to my generations, to our children's generation, and uh, no one really understand how come we sing such gruesome, uh, such frightening uh, song uh, and the music is, uh, stands so much in tension uh, to, to this tale of absolute loss. Uh, yeah, the, the poems at Vesey lost all three nights. One was eaten by a beast, the second died by a sword, and the third era erased the address the adversary from memory. She, she doesn't exist. Uh, her memory doesn't exist anymore. Uh, so the, the whole song revolves around a tension between some kind of ghostly journey it alludes to and the address that hushes it. And night is experienced as an empty environment in which human memory is, is a face. So uh, I, I would really like to move him uh, here without really doing justice to this uh, song of Altoman and Zeira, uh, uh, but, but sharp kind of uh, thinking about this contrast between uh, the 1948 lullaby, which not only divides the lullaby from its audience, but in fact almost literally eliminates the poem's implicated adversity. There is complete nothing. There is no one to talk to, no one to lull to. And this is mediated by the lulling situation. And uh, 
On the other hand, uh, Haviva Pedayas, uh, contemporary Kaddish and laying down of my mother from uh, 2014, which revives both the Lalibai's inner addresses and its ancient communal audience. And at the same time, and those its body languages with, with new liturgical and spiritual roles. And uh, it brings a whole lot of uh, ancient traditions from East and West into this visionary um, opera rock that uh, reframes uh, the lullaby in a completely new way. And maybe we should just listen uh, to, I asked Hein to, to, to play a, a few bits of this uh, really fantastic work in order to, to just see uh, how the whole question of uh, weeping, lamenting, crying out, things that have been associated in the past with the female transition and were like effaced and didn't have any room in the Israeli modernist culture. And uh, uh, Pedaya together with uh, uh, the composers that uh, uh, she works with, uh, they are trying to create a space that will allow um, these languages and also the transformation from uh, one world to another. The question of the lullaby, uh, how do we depart? How do we uh, uh, pass from one space to another? This liminal moment is getting a whole uh, new volume and uh, vision and possibilities in Pedayas. Uh, work. Can we can we hear it?
אפשר לומר על העולם הזה? העולם שברא כרצונו, בעלמא דברא כרעותה, בעלמא דברא כרעותה, ובו מלכותו נסתרת. מלכותו נסתרת והכאב מולך. מה אפשר לומר? מה אפשר לומר על העולם הזה? יתגדל ויתקדש הוא. בעולם שברא כרצונו Thank you. Uh, we don't have time to talk about it, but I just would like to draw your attention to the way uh, this uh, huge work, and I was really privileged to, to audit it in Jerusalem, the, and the, the, the amazing contact that it created with the audience was extremely moving. And uh, uh, there are very intimate moments when Pedaya talks to her mother uh, as a child and as a mother herself changing roles and the the audience is very very uh, the, the addressee the audience is very very tangible and and changes ro roles in real and at the same time it it allows uh, the ritual uh, the the ritual of uh, and of rec the requiem the Kaddish, the ritual of the communities that brings in the wailing women um, and uh, allows a kind of redemption uh, in separating uh, from this world. Maybe the note to finish this talk is, you know, we started with the lulling situation and she asked, Ma Efshar Lagid Alaulam Shibara, what can one say? on the world and she takes this liminal world in a Kabbalistic manner to uh, transform, to transcend uh, to another world. Thank you so much. Thank you, of course. Thank you so much, Lila. This was really amazing and I agree, Mal Shalomar, uh, sort of on your work and this um, amazing research. I know there are a lot of questions about the recordings and we will try and make sure that people have links to the YouTube um, performances and whatnot. I wanna ask with a question of methods in research, how did you do this research, right? How did you find these, right? You know, it's one thing to find something printed. It's another thing to think about the intimate songs, especially between mother and child. These weren't often recorded, right? As you talked about their liminal, can you just tell us about this process of finding these lullabies? I'm so, so happy that, uh, that you asked me this question. Yeah, it took many years. I met mothers from uh, different languages and identities, and I searched into uh, anthologies and into poetry volumes and into archives, and I interviewed folk uh, scholars uh, I, for example, the Palestinian lullaby was, I, I went to talk to Taha Muhammad Ali and he sent me to Naila Libis, who is a big expert in Palestinian folklore. And uh, uh, I, I, I really uh, did a lot of field work. And then I also worked with translators, with poets translators. 
uh, I gave them versions uh, of Iraqi songs, of uh, Bedouin songs, and I asked them to, to um, improvise or to translate or to adapt, because I was very interested in the living speech of Hebrew, how Hebrew can really be enriched and uh, contain and dialogue with these repressed mother tongues. But well, it was a lot of field work and a lot of also searching and reading. Thank you. Um, we had a question about anger, right? Uh, you know, you showed that beautiful Arabic um, lullaby where their mother shows this anger or talks about the anger um, towards the husband, towards the father. Did you find that in other examples of this anger um, in the lullabies? Yes, uh, that's that's very interesting. That the lullaby, the lullaby itself, Ben Yehuda, or the translated version that we have, it doesn't have the the anger, but only the story uh, in the memoir has the anger. But Lorca, uh, in his uh, record of the Andalusian lullabies, he uh, he uh, talks about really frustrations and hard feelings of the uh, Andalusian women that there, there is kind of um, condensed and oblique, but yes, that the wound is there. Also in the Bedouin one that uh, Abu Hamza, uh, he, uh, he was angry that they didn't bring him daughters. So there is anger, anger of the man or, or of, uh, the, the, the woman that copes with, with difficult emotions, male emotions, yes. Yeah, and um, I also want to ask, and I had this question as well, is the question of music, right? Um, we of course have the lyrics, and then there's a question of the tunes, the melodies. Um, what is the relationship between them from, you know, it seemed to me that they were all in a minor key. Um, and you know, what are the contexts and how did you uh, find those as well? Were those things you got from field work? Were they, you know, written down in musical notations, et cetera? That's, that's very, very uh, interesting question. Uh, I found, uh, you know, I looked for recordings. I, I looked for everything I could also in archives. Uh, the relationship uh, is very complex because uh, the lullaby as such, there is a tension between the soothing music for the child and between the context and the words often. But within Israeli lullabies, in the Israeli culture, uh, there was this stage in the, uh, until the middle of the 20th century, this idea of the melting pot, as if we had to unify a collective Hebrew so there was no room, not so much room for different music, for different. So the lullaby was a form that did offer, in spite of the melting pot ideology, differences. And uh, it's very interesting what you ask, because for example, uh, though the lullaby is, there is a, a, a very minimal lexicon and repetitive words, Often the pioneers or uh, the, the composers of the lullabies uh, or the musicians, they brought like music from Hasidic music or from home or from uh, their childhood. And they incorporate, though the, the lullaby itself didn't take those Russian and Yiddish languages, that the music brought it. And for exam example, even in Alterman, the, the, the Laila Laila, the, the music by the era is, is from uh, uh, Eastern Europe. And there is, a, there is a tension between, it's not only one, by the way, one scale. He plays, I'm so glad you asked it, he plays with, with both major and minor. And though it's a very, very short song, there is a, a, a whole to the fourth between the major, the major and the minor scale there. On the other hand, in, in a, a, 
uh, Pdayas, uh, rock poetry, they use one scale, which is called Shu, and it's connected with the elegy, with the kina, uh, and, uh, and it's so interesting how much, how many languages they draw in, though uh, they, they picked one scale all over this, this big uh, uh, oeuvre. And, and so the relations can vary. I can't generalize it. Uh, they, they vary. And, and also maybe, maybe we should say that in Israel, for example, the, um, the, the, the explosion of, of rock music uh, affected the lullabies. And we have different lullabies uh, in the middle of the tw uh, 20th century, in the 16th, 17th, and 80s. They take different musical influences, different cultural influences. Also, the Mizrahi uh, 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 revolution, what, what is called the Mapecha Mizrahit, the Oriental. Right. right. So, right, Jew, right, Jews from Islamic and Arabic countries are of heritage from those countries, right? And that's, of course, perfectly encapsulated by seeing someone like Shai Sabari, right, who performed. Yeah. Um, for those of you who don't know, um, Shai Sabari is an incredible musician and has done a lot of work in the sort of Mizrahi tradition. So as you said, it's no sort of, and including rock music. So it's, you know, almost perfect that we see him here. Um, I wanted to ask about um, Devora Ben Yehuda, because the story I know about Devora Ben Yehuda is that her husband got very mad at her when she sang a Russian lullaby of to course, the child. Right, sure. as you mentioned. So I'm just really curious, thinking of these two together, is this meant as a sort of reparative act in her image, right? How do we square those two stories or texts, um, and especially about the role of women in education and creating, let's say, like the next generation of Hebrew men, let's say, in this case. That, that's, again, a very, very good question, because I didn't have a chance to talk about it, but you see the difference between Dvorah Ben Yehuda. She, she, was her, uh, she was really frightened by, uh, she was terrorized by Ben Yehuda. Others were too, and, uh, but at the same time, she sang the Russian lullaby and the way her son translated it into Hebrew, he really kind of took in the mother tongue. It means she didn't give up, uh, uh, though she had to to subdue to the to the Zionist etis. She found her own little ways to bring in her um, uh, female ethos. But uh, other women in the forties. Uh, in the 40s, there were women like Miriam Yalanshteklis that I mentioned, and Lea Goldberg, and there were Anda. There were, there were poets, uh, women, female poets, and most of them uh, didn't have, the, they were not mothers, but they wrote a really incredible lullaby and renovated the language of the, of the Hebrew uh, an Israeli child by putting in the kind of body and gesture language and things that were more uh, mediating the female trans, uh, tr uh, uh, female body languages and uh, things that were not cognitive and were connected more to the child's language and world and imagination. And it was really women poets who made this change in the 40s. Yeah, and that you ended with this clips from these performance that are sort of a virtue of a version of mourning, a public mourning. Uh, and of course, the tradition of women being these public mourners, that's something that goes back to the Bible, right? We have this in the Bible, this idea of the wailing women. Um, certain Mizrahi and Arab communities still practice it today. Of course, it's unfortunately becoming less common. And I was wondering if you could comment on just 
the links between these liminal spaces that you pointed out, right? There's the between sleep and being awake. There's what's said and unsaid. Um, and of course there's death and something we associate with childhood, with these lullabies. So, and especially given that a lot of these lullabies, both in what you've talked about today and in general are often violent or at least mention violent things, either satirically or sort of more seriously. Uh, and I was just wondering if you could comment a bit on that. Yeah, so it was two questions. One was in the uh, lament yeah, tradition. Sorry, I snuck another and one in that's, there. That's very important. I, I'm glad you brought it up because I felt that I didn't, I didn't do justice and I didn't have time to talk about it. But that really, the, the, the uh, Kaddish and Ashkava blame the, 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 this big uh, lullaby, requiem that reframes the lullaby is a cooperation between Haviva Pedaya, who is a great poet, writer, and a scholar of Jewish mysticism, and Mark and Peretz Eliyahu. Uh, and uh, that, and uh, 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 Peretz Eliyahu is, a, is really a very interesting visionary composer uh, who was born in uh, Tadistan in Russia. And the, the cop, and it, it connects with what you say because he, he did a big do, job on lamenting women in the, in the mountains. And he went to, to folk music and to, to the lamentation and to the weeping women. And, and Pedaya comes from the Iraq, Iraq tradition, the lullaby, the, the, the women, the women uh, poems in Iraq have in them a lot of the, the wailing tradition. So you're right that it's also biblical, but it also brings in Orient, different Oriental tradition and Jewish Arab traditions. And, and the whole, uh, even the, the, the uh, it is also connected with a Kabbalistic practice of crying that, helps one and it connects to your to your last question of the liminal space because in the lullaby the liminal space is both of the mother of the child the mother is dying that he will already fall to sleep and uh, and it's it's frightening it's a frightening uh, moment and it's also a moment that she she kind of uh, isolates the child, but she wants to separate from him and to send him to his way. Now, this liminal moment is taken by uh, a, the work of uh, Pedaya, this, this rock opera, uh, in a, amplified to, to the, the potential in the lullaby uh, to cross over from, from life to death and from death to life and to overcome this this fear uh, uh, by the mother's installation. So it's really uh, here it comes together uh, with uh, an atonement of the mother, of like lulling the mother, separating from her and bringing also liturgical traditions uh, that also some of the lullabies in the 20th century like came from them, like Bialik, for example. And, and uh, some Yiddish uh, lullaby. So it's, it's, it's very intricate, but it's excellent questions because everything I couldn't talk about. Thank you. Um, I understand that before I finished, you also wanted to thank a couple of people. Um, yes, of yeah. course. Uh, I would like to thank so much uh, your invitation, the director of Shisterman Center, Jonathan Sarna, for inviting me to talk. And to all of you, who have made this encounter wonderfully possible, Associate Director Shayna Weiss, and also your wonderful questions, acute questions, Associate Director Risa Singer, Communications Specialist Karen Goodblatt, uh, Program coordinate, coordin Coordinator Anna Simpson, uh, Heim Dorching, and for all of you auditors who have been with us tonight, thank you so much. So thank you again, Leela. This was such an incredible way to end a really spectacular year of virtual programming at Schusterman. Check us out on social media, check out events you may have missed on our YouTube channel. We are excited to hear from all of you and have a lovely day. Thank you again.